Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Krish Subramanian from Rishi Dot Research. We are going to do a virtual panel on YA in the enterprise. We have a pretty good uh, group here uh, willing to talk about what they know about YA adoption in enterprise. So I will let the guests introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Miles. Hi, everybody. My name is Miles Ward. I run solutions architecture as a practice inside of Google's cloud offering. A big part of that is machine learning. So excited to participate. Kevin? Hello, I'm Kevin McGrath. I'm a uh, senior CTO architect for SunGuard Availability Services. And in the CTO group, we're trying to stay out in front of whatever new technologies are going to help uh, us as a service provider and our customers uh, in the years, you know, years in front of the current business plan. Sam? Hi, I'm Sam Charrington. I'm founder and principal analyst with Cloud Pulse Strategies, a uh, advisory firm that's helping, uh, and, uh, helping organizations understand machine learning and AI. And I'm also the host of This Week in Machine Learning and AI podcast. Uh, and hopefully you can see the URL down there, twimlai.com. And uh, I have recorded a podcast with Sam and yet to publish it. Soon you will see that uh, live too. Okay, next, Grant. Hey, I'm Grant Warnick. I'm CEO of Insight Engines. Uh, Insight Engines builds natural language search technologies. What we do is we make uh, machine data queryable, queryable by anybody, no matter how technical you are. Um, our flagship product is for cybersecurity investigation, and it's called CSI, and it makes it so you can do queries like, uh, show me traffic today from China versus the last 30 days. It gives you the standard deviations, the moving averages, and it gives you all like the output of the, of the query code you'd have to write. Um, so basically the things that take your most advanced people maybe a week, our product can do in seconds. And so, uh, yeah, it's really exciting times for us as a company. Yeah, in fact, uh, thanks to Grant, that's what gave me the idea of to host this panel. I, I was uh, doing some research uh, after you were getting a briefing from Grant. And that's when like, uh, I thought maybe putting out some insight for, uh, for the peer readers about where AI is in the enterprise will be good. So thanks everybody. Thanks for having uh, being part of this uh, virtual panel. And I think the uh, discussions are going to be interesting. My, uh, I want to start off with setting a level, uh, sort of some, some sort of context. So I would like everybody to, from your vantage point, talk about where the evolution of AI in the enterprise and uh, possibly rate it in a scale of one to ten. So uh, I would lo love to know at what stage it is. Like I, from uh, based on the research I have done, I figure out that uh, the AI adoption is in the early stages. But you might have a different perspective on that, and uh, I'd love to get uh, get your thoughts from your vantage point. Who wants to go first? I can go first. Okay. So. Oh, I work with new enterprise businesses every day. That's what my team focuses on at Google is helping our largest customers be successful with Google's technologies and very importantly in their machine learning. And there isn't a single one of those conversations that doesn't involve machine learning and artificial intelligence technology. There isn't a single one of our corporate partners that's not thoroughly in engaged in understanding how machine learning and artificial intelligence will alter their business or transform their business going forward. And it, it tends to span the full gamut from their most basic internal robotic process automation, systematic uh, business processes kind of work all the way through prediction and analysis of data across their customer and, and market spaces. Those kinds of engagements now are moving much more quickly than I think any of us expected from, hmm, that's kind of an interesting prototype to this is production code our business depends on. Um, and that, that acceleration through what was normally, you know, if the hype cycle is supposed to take us four years, it's not taking that long for these enterprise businesses to find at least their first and second footholds where profitable application of its technology is, is just weeks away. So when you yeah, say so enterprise customers, uh, do you, can you talk about the, how big an enterprise it is and what kind of verticals it is? Uh, yeah. I, I do see some in the financial sector and healthcare taking advantage of either machine learning or AI, depending on uh, what product they're using. But uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the size of the enterprise you're talking about and also 
the kind of verticals you're talking about? Sure. There's one super handy example uh, that you may have heard of called Google, one of the larger businesses on the planet. It is uh, a fact that every single production product today, uh, over 2,700 distinct functions at Google are now optimized or improved in some way by machine learning. Our downstream customers are coming from a, a myriad verticals, absolutely seeing healthcare uh, starting to dive into looking at um, doing identification on behalf of doctors for things like cancer and melanomas and, and looking through, um, you know, for uh, retinopathy kinds of analyses. You've also got a lot of work happening in retail, trying to understand cohort analysis and what's happening as things move through the e-commerce shopping cart and how is there a relationship between online and offline shoppers. We've got a lot of work happening in financial services. A lot of that is financial liquidity modeling and fraud detection. Uh, folks being able to insure against chargeback and take other kinds of constructive approaches to improving uh, improving the efficiency of the transaction flow that they manage. We also have a lot of work happening in entertainment and gaming as folks are trying to understand how to observe and better react to players and to entertainment participants and be able to give them a more personalized, unique experience. We've also got a lot, a lot of work happening in big science where uh, from imaging and audio analysis and video analysis, being able to crack perception, being able to make it so that at scale for billions of records, you can have the same kind of intuitive, hands-on reaction that a person would have, but uh, without getting sleepy and doing it on Sundays and doing it in the middle of the night and doing it all week long. So that kind of um, broad applicability is was one of the clearest signals to us that this is a market we have to be very, very invested in. Uh, before I go to the other uh, panelists, uh, one more follow-up question to that. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, Sam. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, my question is, leaving science aside, so all the examples you gave are more in the machine learning space. So, do, are you seeing any, any uh, adoption on uh, NLC, computer vision, or things that could uh, be termed as AI space? Sorry, repeat the last part of that question. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Think, uh, are you seeing any adoption in machine learning? Uh, sorry, NLP or computer vision, things like that, which could be termed as artificial intelligence uh, to sort of distinguish from other machine, machine, basic machine learning models. Sure, sure. I mean, like it, literally, one of the members of my team built a chat bot together with one of our banking com customers as a demonstration during a sales call. And that is now the production system that they use in interacting with a percentage of their customers. The turnaround time there is literally on the order of hours because the performance is so obviously measurable as being improved over what customers are exposed to today. So the end customer on the other side just sees faster, more articulate, more professional interactions that allow them to get the answers that they want more quickly. And a lot of that is built on the technologies, uh, one that we've built in-house in Google Assistant, and then also from acquisitions like API.ai and others. Okay, let's go to the other panelists, sorry. Yeah, so there's a couple of, uh, a couple of ways I'd attack that question. Um, you know, as an analyst, it's important to define terms and you kind of uh, started to define, you know, draw out this distinction between machine learning and, and AI. Um, but there's also uh, a difference in like how we think of enterprise adoption. Like I think um, when I think of how enterprises will adopt AI, uh, and this is true for machine learning technologies as well, um, you know, I think of it like an iceberg, right? And kind of the part of the, the iceberg that's above the water, the small part is going to be, you know, those AI systems that the enterprises are building themselves, like training models using TensorFlow and scikit-learn and all that kind of stuff. Um, but the, the massive part of the iceberg below the waterline is going to be enterprises you know, getting AI as part of the things that they're already, the technology that, are, that they're already using. So, you know, AI built into their CRM, AI built into their ERP, AI built into their office suite, AI built into their phones. Uh, and so, you know, depending on which of those you're looking at, you know, you could say that enterprises are, you know, close to nine or 10 out of that scale, right? They, they all, you know, somewhere in that organization, someone is using something you know, by a company that's built some intelligence to it, into it. Um, 
at the same time, I think organizations actually kind of building ground up uh, their own, you know, what we would think of AI solutions is, you know, probably much, it's much less mature, right? So we're, you know, on the four type of uh, side of that scale. Uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of that though, and speaking specifically about AI, I think Miles mentioned, you know, where the, you know, what the tip of the spear is uh, for those types of applications. It's really, you know, we think about how we used to talk about systems of engagement versus systems of record. It's like that, that engagement interface is where people are looking at uh, a lot of AI deployment today. So these are things like chatbots for sales, chatbots for support, you know, other ways to create better customer and, and user experiences through intelligence. Yeah, Kevin or uh, Grant? So, I mean, I, I, I echo a lot of what Sam just said. Uh, what we're seeing, it, it depends on the enterprise that you're going after, right? Some enterprises are so big, they have smaller groups that move super fast. And they're adopting a lot of the new AI stuff right off the bat. Your TensorFlow, moving along with profit, building stuff in-house. Um, a lot of enterprises, your, your more mid-range enterprises, uh, get it out of services. And that's exactly right. You know, that bottom part of that iceberg. It's funny, they're not necessarily going to be using AI in-house, and they may not have someone in-house that necessarily knows AI, but they will ask the question when they buy a service, does your service use AI? Um, and that's going to be more of an expected thing as we come. You know, they're going to be looking for that, you know, structured learning on a specific topic that a service provides to them. And so enterprises, as they get more, you know, the, I guess the term now is serviceful in what they acquire, as they get more and more comfortable of not building everything in-house, but, you know, outsourcing more and more of the services that they use, they will require more of those services um, to have AI, or, they, or I should say the AI services will probably move to the top of that list because they're gonna be able to provide better data to their customers over time. Um, I, I think the big change for enterprises actually adopting machine learning and um, AI in-house is actually you know, where we are in big data right now. So we, we came to this point with big data, we were building these big data things in-house and then we realized, well, we gotta put some of it up in the cloud because it's just too big and we need massive amounts of compute and we have to do all these big old Hadoop clusters and we need tons of engineers to do all these algorithms and tweak the algorithms and redo the algorithms. and uh, we, we're really, really, really good at ingesting just tons of data. What we haven't been great at is doing great things with that data. And how do we add more, more, more value on top of that data? And machine learning and AI, when it gets to a point where enterprises can take that and start uh, really manipulating their big data lakes, with ML and AI reliably, uh, because one thing you have to realize with, especially a lot of these mid-range enterprises, is they're very used to very static inputs and very static outputs, and that's how their testing goes. They're used to having a certain set, like A is gonna go in one side and B is gonna come out the other. And with machine learning, that's, that's not really, you can put A, B, and C in one side and you'll get B with a deviation of error out on the other side. Um, and you wanna try and drive that down, um, to an exact answer every single time. It, it depends on the data set that you're working with and how much data goes in and out. But um, I really think machine learning AI is going to help the big data problem. And whether that's by a service or whether a uh, enterprise is big enough to do it in-house, um, I, I don't know the exact road there, but to do it in-house, you have these enterprises who have to do massive changes. They have to change from hiring developers to hiring data scientists. Um, just, you know, having developers is great, and we, got, we have some great developers who are, are running with things like Profit, but um, having a data scientist to really scrutinize the data to make sure you're using the right, you know, the right neural network, you know, make sure the algorithms that you're all using during the whole process um, are getting the desired outcomes on a consistent basis you want. I think you either need a data scientist or you need a partner who's a data scientist at the end of the day, and I think enterprises are just getting into that space. Okay, so before Grant talks about uh, his thoughts on that, like I have a follow-up question. So what is stopping enterprises from uh, doing that? Like, uh, is, it, uh, is it the mindset issue or is it, uh, is it not understanding what it yeah, can give or is there a technology problem? What exactly is stopping uh, enterprises to embrace that? 
I mean, that's a great question. And what, what we have in front of us right now is you have a lot of, you know, to use, if we're going to use more big analogies like icebergs, you know, you have aircraft carriers that we normally describe, you know, mid to larger size enterprises too. And it's, it's hard to turn them. And while when you're in this industry, it feels like things have become de facto very fast, really um, the advent of things like TensorFlow and research at Facebook and things like that, we're talking maybe four years, 2012, I believe, is when they really probably started hitting the ground running on these applications that could really get these tools, I should say, that get into the developer's hands very quickly. And I don't think the talent just grows instantaneous around that. I think you have great companies, you know, like Google and Facebook and AWS and people like that who are pushing the bar on machine learning and contributing those ideas back to the community. I think it takes longer for enterprises to um, to latch onto that. I also think it takes longer for budgets and different things to just go, oh yeah, this is gonna work, where it goes from maybe a pet project to an actual thing. And I think that's why you see services, uh, companies that start around AI and can sell to the enterprise, You know, that's gonna happen a lot faster than I think, um, you know, in, I should say the majority of enterprises, you'd carving out different spots for like an AI, AI or ML group. Um, I think the technology has come a long way, um, a long, long way. I mean, AI is something we've been talking about for as long as I've been alive. Um, it's, it's, that, it's, it's been around forever, but the technology and how GPUs and how some of these open source projects have really accelerated things over the past three to four years, is amazing and I think maybe over the next three to five you might actually see instead of a dev you know inside your DevOps group or whatever we're gonna call it in the future you'll have a data scientist or you know a machine learning or AI expert right Great. I think another point on that if I can jump in is um, <clears throat> you know back to the back to the earlier point about kind of defining what we're talking about when we say AI like I think in terms of machine learning um, there's actually a lot of it happening now and you know, the reason that's part of the reason why you don't see organizations like spinning up a lot of efforts to chase after deep learning. There's so much low hanging fruit in just applying some pretty basic machine learning to figure out, you know, what leads to chase after why customers are churning, you know, what the right marketing mix is, uh, what real estate to buy, you know, it, it, and that is sucking up all of their statistical knowledge, right? It's not that they don't have data scientists, it's that they're you know, they're in the line of business and they call them marketing analysts or marketing statisticians and stuff like that. They're there and they're solving real problems using some pretty rudimentary, but, you know, fundamentally powerful machine learning that, you know, they really can only just take advantage of because the data is in place. We've got ready access to compute now. Um, and the the AI, you know, if there's benefit to kind of the AI hype cycle is that it's putting uh, it on the executive ro ro roadmap and radar and it's creating a lot of air cover for these teams to, you know, instead of using their old, you know, SAS, SPSS statistical modeling packages to try to build out some applications and get them, uh, build out some machine learning models and get them integrated into their applications to feed into automation. Grant? So I'm going to, I'm going to add a lot more to that and what Sam just said. Um, so I spent the better half of a decade doing a part of AI that everybody calls AI, which is natural language processing technologies and um, living and breathing this stuff for as long as I, as I have, I see the term AI really overused. And lately I've seen it ridiculously overused everywhere I go. Every product has AI and it's, we're, I'm on a call right now with folks that really understand AI and actually are using AI and it just get, it just gets me really excited. Uh, but I see so many products that are pretending to, uh, to have AI because we're in the early days, we're pioneers and it's the wild west. And there's lots of people selling snake oil and most people are using a handful of machine learning algorithms and calling themselves an AI company. Or a lot of people are using very basic statistics or they're doing things like sentiment analysis and saying, oh, it's AI. And it's and, and and people need to understand, the customers need to understand, and need to, we need to. It's, I, I think it's kind of our job to educate them on what is AI and what isn't AI, and uh, what's machine learning, what's natural language, what's IA. So what I do, the search technology I create is IA or intelligence augmentation. 
Uh, we do, uh, it's a subset of AI and we make humans smarter. We give them insights faster and, and we're there to really be an assistant to them in a lot of ways, um, using the knowledge that's in their head, asking our, our system questions and our system being a major accelerator for them. And this is, this is a part of AI, AI that I think is really becoming, um, really becoming powerful. So if you think about a lot of the things people are doing with machine learning algorithms, you get a lot of clean data in, now you can do something that's, uh, that's a 20x, 100x multiplier, and it's a piece that makes the humans more intelligent and, intelligent and better. And companies like Google and companies like Facebook can use it every single day, but some of our customers are some of the largest, uh, you could say healthcare, or largest government organizations on the planet, and they're barely scratching the surface around, the, around this stuff. Um, they're doing mostly statistics. They're doing a little bit of machine learning. And products uh, like the stuff we all create, guys, we're, we're kind of here to help them and guide them into the future. And, and we're in a really privileged place to, to be able to do this. Uh, so the state, of, the state of AI in our enterprise, um, major Fortune 500s, major Fortune 100s, uh, and some of the largest organizations on the planet, it's, uh, we're barely scratching the surface. And one of the reasons why is they have actually a lot of smart people. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why is data is still super siloed and people can't get their hands around all the data to do the correlations they need. So one product that we spend a lot of time working with is, uh, is Splunk. Splunk's a great product to get things into one place. And people are using Hadoop for these kinds of things as well. Hadoop works for more uniform sets. Splunk is more for time series. And you're, and you're seeing a world where people are starting to get data in the right places uh, and this has always been one of the biggest problems. We have all the best algorithms. We actually have some really simple ones that you can get a lot out of, like Chris was, uh, um, Sam was just saying a second ago. And and we just need to we just need to be able to be able to help people scratch the surface and kind of be their coach. Uh, that sort of uh, brings us into uh, I think uh, some of the some people have addressed this question already, but I would love to get a sort of uh, feedback uh, from the uh, rest of the people. So. For a CIO or for a decision maker in the enterprise, wanting to think about how they can bring AI to the, uh, inside their organization, apart from using something like a G, a G Suite or something which uses AI already, or uh, even uh, the spam filter, which is already there for in almost every enterprise which uses machine learning. So what are the low hanging fruits uh, they can think about and they can start tackling? So that they can slowly bring it in without disrupting the morale of the people because disrupting the morale of the people is also important when it comes to bringing AI into, into the workforce. So how, how, can, how can they go about doing it? Any uh, suggestions, any best practices, uh, sure. suggestions? Yeah. Sure, three things right off the top. I, I, I really want to echo Grant's label, uh, uh, intelligence augmentation as a more powerful way for most businesses to think about artificial intelligence in line with their business services. I also, you know, if you think about what Sam said around, I want a CRM with AI built in, I want a ERP with AI built in. Imagine if those products presented to you and said, we are a CRM without statistics. We are a, a, an MRP without statistics of any kind. We don't really do any accounting. You would think that those products are terrible. And it's a very short period of time <laughs> between now and when it will be obvious that products that don't have basic recurrent neural networks being used to do more efficient projection of outcomes than, than modern statistics can perform, it will just seem like that's hilariously inefficient stuff. So we are watching all of the major SaaS providers, all of the major technology and software vendors dive in deep on this. And if you think about what the CIO and the VPs of engineering and the CTO are looking at inside of an organization and how they can apply machine learning, I, I'm seeing three different strategies. And the first, uh, and I don't think this comes as a surprise to anybody, is while we don't know jack about this, let's buy a company that does. So I'm watching a lot of little acquisitions to build in a little in-house team that has some clue about this technology to be able to bring some smarts to bear against the problem. Some of that's happening by way of partnership or alliance, but, but largely by acquisition. Uh, a second strategy that's been pretty popular is, is sort of older brands or uh, uh, you know, experienced companies, entertainment companies, gaming companies that have a great relationship with their customers but don't have access to this technology bundling in with the hottest technology partners. I think we saw kind of runaway success with what was an incredibly technically sophisticated game 
in, uh, in uh, Ingress converted into the largest mobile game in history with, uh, with Pokemon Go. That, that partnership created an opportunity for them to optimize using machine learning. And I think the third area where we're seeing a lot uh, happening is just a radical investment in onboarding and training. Our teams are spending an unbelievable ratio of our time in what seems like, you know, well, we're going to go do a proof of concept. That's not actually what's happening. We're just deep diving and training their teams on how to use these tools and apply them to problems that we've already seen run to ground. And at one of the places where most enterprises are finding surprising success is in the cross application insights from one vertical really playing out very successfully in another. It turns out most people's data is still data and it's not all that hard to see that a, you know, identifying the difference between clouds and snow in pictures is pretty close to the difference between cancer and just not cancer in somebody's lungs, right? The same image recognition technology has the same effects. And so as businesses realize how broadly useful this stuff is, they're, they're more than happy to make the investments in training and onboarding. Are you right? so, yeah, go, go ahead, Jen. Oh, so yeah, I, I think image, uh, Miles, image, image recognition is something that uh, is a really great example of where machine learning is just incredible. By the way, Pokemon Go is a really good example too. And the other one is Translate. Translate, you have so many uh, examples out there. You have so much uh, lear uh, training data. So anything that enterprises have a lot of training data on is a great place for us to apply and uh, um, apply various uh, algorithms. So things like if you're a large company with a lot of shipping and receiving, well, you have a lot of data there that you could optimize. Things like uh, sales process, and you have a lot of data in Salesforce around your process, and you have a 500 person sale, sales team. That's a great place to utilize it as well. Uh, and so I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of companies starting to use it in very, very pointed uh, places, and it's very pointed results that, that they're getting out. Uh, but we're also seeing, like, with, with, um, with a lot of our technology, so we're, cyber, we're focused on cybersecurity investigation. But and we're also focused on democratization of data, and so something that Miles pointed out was how the same, how uh, different groups are getting uh, getting insights now. And one thing that we're finding is like so, for instance, people looking at various websites is maybe the security team's been doing that for a long time to find bad websites, sites with malware, things that are bad actors, porn, that kind of stuff. Well, now the HR team. Because now we have, they have new tools like like what we do. Now the HR team can uh, can ask like, hey, who's looking at job sites? Who's been doing that a lot? And now they can help uh, keep the people they really want to keep at a company. And so we're seeing that because of IA, like the kind of stuff that that we do, and um, the machine learning examples I gave a second ago, you're seeing it spread into organizations, just starting to spread into organizations that never would have thought. And this kind of goes back to, to to what Sam was saying a second ago, and maybe you want us to talk more about that. Yeah, so when I think about- In Two seconds, there's, or you can do that backwards. We just released a jobs API, so you can send every job in and we have a machine learning model that'll pick the right one for you. So you don't even have to go to the site. We'll just oh, nice. Can we <laughs> can nice, that's good. <laughs> nice, nice. When I think of uh, use cases and, you know, from the perspective of an organization that, you know, wants to identify some starting places, I think I of them in, two slash three buckets, right? So the first one are horizontal applications. Uh, and so these are use cases that most every enterprise has, right? There's sales, there's support, there's marketing, there's IT, there's operations, right? And sales, you know, we've talked about, you know, lead scoring, we've talked about, um, you know, customer engagement. So a chat bot on the website, that kind of uh, use case, pre-sales support, uh, in technical support, there's, you know, support triage. So how do I, you know, triage inbound support requests so I can get people with simple requests, their answers faster or, you know, more quickly to resolution and then reserve the limited support resource that I have to those more complex uh, requests that really need to be handled by human. Um, in IT, there's this stuff like what Grant is doing, giving you know, IT analysts essentially superpowers to, you know, manipulate uh, and analyze data to produce, you know, to secure the enterprise, to make enterprise applications more performant, et cetera. Um, and you can kind of spin across all these horizontal use cases. Then there are a set of vertical use cases um, that are industry specific. So if I'm a, a research hospital, right, we talked about uh, 
uh, I think it was Miles mentioned uh, using image processing for uh, radiology. Um, there are huge applications there, you know, across all different types of radiological images and, you know, uh, pathological conditions. Um, there's, um, you know, I just did a, a research paper on industrial AI that covers, you know, manufacturing, covers logistics and supply chain, um, you know, and there are tons of low hanging fruit uh, applications there like predictive maintenance, predictive management of, um, you know, machinery. Um, so, you know, horizontal, vertical, and then there are like, you know, technology driven use cases uh, for lack of a better term. And that's not necessarily the best way or place to start, um, but it can be a clue for an organization that, um, you know, if you know that uh, image interpretation is uh, something that is newly enabled by deep neural networks and you have a, a business that has a lot of imagery, there's probably something in there for you. You know, likewise with, uh, if you have a lot of audio, you know, we've, you know, we've developed over the past few years uh, an incredible ability to interpret that, uh, that audio. Um, and there are use cases around some of the more advanced things that uh, we're starting to see in the field, like uh, reinforcement learning, uh, as they apply to, you know, robotic control and uh, optimization for things like marketing campaigns and supply chain and things like that. Uh, so that's kind of the, you know, the rubric that I tell people about when they're starting to figure out, you know, where should I be looking to figure out how to apply this in my organization? Kevin? Yeah, I think if, if I had to go up to a CIO today, especially for the type of customers that de we deal with, and they looked at me and go, okay, I don't care about chatbots. Even though chatbots are awesome, we're working on one too, because you have to be working on a chatbot. But if a CIO came up to me today and said, like, where do I do this? How do I, how do I put ML in today? I think one of the best spots to get into is forecasting analysis. Um, you know, your, your big data that you have sitting around, you used to probably have all these custom type algorithms or you bought a, bus of, bought a bunch of custom type solutions to do some sort of prediction analysis on the data that you have. And they're all probably a little bit different. With ML and AI, you know, through transfer, the, the great thing about moving from structured learning to kind of transferred learning is that transferred learning, you can use the same type of uh, the, the same type of neural networks on a variety of different things. So if you get like a good ML forecasting model that works, you can use that forecasting model. You can use it on data. You can use it, you can use it based on, hey, is a server going to go down? Is a client going to churn? Is, um, is my billing going to spike? Is all kinds of things. You can apply it to all these different data sets. And what's really cool about it is you can use the same team of developers to do it. Because um, you're using that same engine in the background to do your forecasting. Um, I know with big data solutions, sometimes everyone uses the same big data infrastructure, but you have different teams doing all your forecasting, prediction modeling, different things like that. Everybody can be doing their own thing. Machine learning can narrow that scope down so everyone's focused on not only using the same infrastructure platform, but the same prediction platform. And you could go forward there. Now, there's a ton of other cool things. And I mean, Sam and Grant and Miles came up. I mean, all of that stuff is coming down the pipe. But if I had if I had to mention something today that I think would hit CIO's ears, would be like, how are you doing forecasting? Is it reliable? How many people do you have work on working on it? How big's your data lake that you have using it? You can probably find a really, really good solution for forecasting modeling using machine learning. Yeah. Before we talk about the next topic, like I would love to get, get since we are still talking about adoption in enterprise, I would like to uh, love to know. Uh, from you, how is the adoption happening? Is it a top-down mandate or is it a bottoms-up mandate? If it is the bottoms-up, uh, sorry, is it a bottoms-up adoption, just like how it was in the case of cloud, DevOps, open source, etc. So if it is a bottoms-up adoption, there is a question by a Twitter user about silos coming into uh, AI adoption. Uh, can central IT sort of uh, push it over to all the organizations? organizations or if developers are just going to use AI services, is it going to bucket into silos, which is going to create other problems uh, as the uh, maturity of the organization improves? Is it going to create any other problem? So I would love to get your thoughts on that. I mean, uh, I think it's based, both. On, based on what I've seen, um, compared, if you're going to use cloud as the comparison, I think AI is absolutely starting more top down. 
than the cloud race did. I think a lot of that is due to the fact that there's a preconceived notion that the technical sophistication required is higher. I think everybody thought that the cloud people were sort of using a VPS and they would figure out how to use computers and that shit's not all that complicated. Uh, and I think that's actually upside down. Um, in personal experience, cloud computing can get fantastically complicated. You're gonna refactor all your applications into serverless code and let's migrate database backends in and then you're changing all this commercial crap you don't have access to. Uh, where artificial intelligence, like uh, I can write a single REST call and send some pictures and then I get back whether there are dogs and cats in them, like one line and it's just not all that tough. And it, you know, if I wanna train a big data set, I, you know, I add the data into TensorFlow and then I run a query against it and I get the answer back. Like technically, in terms of like amount of lines written, amount of changes that have to be managed, are, even today, machine learning application to basic data should be easier than a migration to cloud computing. And I think it's that, the evidence of that in the time cycle that it's taken for some businesses to get to their first valuable returns on this stuff in comparison to like Netflix taking seven years to migrate to cloud, there you have every enterprise guy going, well, hold on, maybe I can get a turnaround in fast enough time that this shows up in my quarterly earnings or this shows up in this year's report. And that's created the impetus for a lot of top-down drive for investment. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely seeing that. I think, um, you know, some of it comes from, you know, magazine, uh, management by magazine article, right? It's like the hype cycle. Every, every th time you turn on a, a, go to a website or visit a magazine, you know, it's like AI, you need to be doing AI. And that really does impact, you know, CEOs and CIOs, right? The CEO says to the CIO, what are we doing about AI? What's our AI strategy? The CIO, you know, says that to, you know, their VPs and it kind of trickles down. Um, but at the same time, I am also seeing a really strong uh, bottoms up uh, interest that in a lot of ways is, is driven by some of the same factors. Um, but the, you know, the underlying emotional drive is kind of this feeling that if I don't get with this, I'm not going to be relevant in a few years. And so you have tons of, you know, engineers and people, you know, across IT organizations that are trying to really understand, you know, what is this technology? What is it capable of now? What do I need to do? And what do I need to be aware of to, you know, help my organization be successful with it? Um, you know, in a lot of ways, I, you know, I run into tons of those folks just as listeners to my podcast. They're, you know, listening to people talking about research because they want to know, okay, I ha I, I'm responsible for X, Y, Z in my organization. You know, I'm not a machine learning engineer. I'm not a data scientist, but I need to, kn I need to know what these people are talking about in the vocabulary and what are their challenges in order to effectively enable them. Uh, and again, because I know that that is a big part of how I'll remain relevant over the next decade. Um, so I think, you know, looking at it, you know, solely as this top down mandate, um, you know, doesn't do, do justice or service to all of the work that's happening, you know, on an individual and a team basis to really build up capability in this area. Okay, assuming uh, that's the bottom up uh, growth uh, inside any organization. Would it not lead to silos with uh, whatever the benefits of AI being siloed into a specific group? And uh, would it not lead to a suboptimal? Uh, yeah, who cares, Chris? Right. That's, like, that's like five years ago saying, you know, okay, this group is playing with uh, Google and this group is playing with Amazon as they're coming up to speed on cloud. And like, you know, should the enterprise architecture team squash it all, you know, and standardize it? Yeah, let's make everyone wait until we figured out what the ultimate end all be all solution is for AI. That's ridiculous. It's just moving so fast. You know, like two months ago, like six weeks ago, everyone thought that the end all be all for deep learning framework was TensorFlow, right? No question. It was, you know, it's TensorFlow forever. And now like over literally overnight, you know, PyTorch is like all the rave and it's a question mark, right? Not saying that it's not going to be TensorFlow, but you know, there's a question mark. This stuff is moving way too quickly. And I don't think that, you know, I don't think that we're at the cycle of the market where people need to spend a lot of time worrying about, you know, silos and, you know, to some extent, you know, when you're dealing with, or not even to some extent, you know, to a large extent, when you're dealing with real data, you've got to worry about other governance issues 
you know, that deal with, you know, PII and um, privacy and, and, you know, exposure of data, you know, you, you need to worry about issues like, are you building biases into your, uh, into your products because you're training on biased data? You know, there's all kinds of issues like that that you need to worry about. Uh, but I don't think it's like, you know, are we but, choosing- uh, Yeah, to, to sort of uh, specifically tackle that problem about biases and stuff like that. Having a siloed approach is going to impact, uh, right? Like uh, it is better if we sort of have a more centralized uh, uh, control over what is happening. Uh, let's say if it is a small group down there in the basement building something out with their own biases in the coming and creeping into it, it is going to impact my organization. As a CAO, I'll be worried, should I worry about it today or should I ta ta tackle it today? Uh, by all like yeah. three, point to another day. So, that's so here's where I agree with you. I think, you know, all of these things that we're talking about are built on data, right? right. And if your data is in a hundred silos, it's going to be a lot harder for you to build anything of meaning, uh, you know, in that kind of environment. So, you know, organizations that have taken the lead in integrating their data or establishing data lakes uh, to Kevin's point and, uh, beyond that, establishing data governance policies, establishing, you know, groups of people that think about uh, data um, and can, you know, are equipped with the, the tool sets to think about issues like this bias issue. Um, those organizations are going to be a lot further ahead. Who's going to win the race? You, we're in two teams. One of us, even if we run around in circles, we're jogging and yeah, we go the wrong way this way and the wrong way this way and the wrong way this way until we get to the starting line. Or the other team sits cross-legged patiently and atrophies <laughs> while they think about which direction to go, right? I, I will make the bet on the folks that even literally run in exactly the wrong direction for the next year is insofar as they are practicing the application of this technology to data, right? But, the skills that you learn on evaluating information using this in TensorFlow are hugely translatable into doing it in PyTorch or in Thano or in every other ridiculous right. framework for this stuff. Another huge benefit is it'd be one thing if you were running with handcuffs on, but we're all talking about and exclusively talking about open source technologies for doing this stuff. So business has made this logical leap forward and you'll note that there is no zero competitive commercial option for machine learning technology, which I have to say is like incredibly delightful. Mm -hmm. So hopefully everybody gets the point that this point that experimentation and, and self-education, even if it's, you know, mm -hmm. a little off to the left is going to so, pay. I fully agree. I think Grant is waiting to answer, uh, give us a take on that. Uh, my point was not about the lock-in issue or the portability issue where open source and all that uh, really matters. My point is like, uh, the ROI being suboptimal if we are if you are siloing in siloing the AI into smaller group or right. even like a, that's what I'm more, more worried about than locking or portability issues and which, uh, which you know, today it's okay like uh, manageable and like you know there's a, a big part of me you know for which that argument resonates like a lot of my you know coming from uh, studying platform as a service and being uh, really focused on that as an enabler for development teams. You know, I started writing about machine learning platforms six years ago, like the same types of platform dynamics uh, come into play. And if you're an enterprise and you're investing heavily in this, at some point in time, you're going to want to have a platform that, you know, takes care of all the grunt work for you, um, that, you know, you can train all your teams on and kind of get them up to speed and a set of best practices and all that, like in a uniform way that automates all of the underlying, you know, plumbing for you that has like a model library that you can pull from to take advantage of some of the dynamics that Kevin was referring to. Um, but, you know, think about like the, the past adoption cycle. It's like it take there's a point in the maturity process for this stuff, you know, where those things are important. And you know, we're barely getting there for platform as a service, right? You know, relative to the infrastructure as a service adoption cycle, we're a ways from that uh, for uh, machine learning and AI. But I am a, I'm a huge, like I'm a believer in it. Uh, I just don't think it's like top of the enterprise priority list today. There's only one difference between those two. 
platform as a service and infrastructure as a service you pay gallons of money for and have plenty of options that can commercially lock you in. In machine learning, there is no way to write someone a check. You can't actually make the investment that you're talking about making. All you're doing is training people. Yeah, and that's I, there are tons of companies that will take your money and gonna make a standard platform. that investments in humans are going to pay off really well in this area. Okay, I mean, Grant. Companies yeah. like, uh, as, as like IBM has the the whole Watson thing, is massive services company around this right. Kind of stuff, yeah. right? Uh, but so back to what Chris was saying just a few minutes ago, which is about um, where is it coming from? And uh, something that's to build off what Sam said, yeah, there's all these silos, but I'm finding that machine learning and engineering organizations, oftentimes the products we sell are not to the engineering organization, but I have a lot of friends running very large companies, my company as well. Um, one thing that you see, because it is a top-down thing, like the CIO or the CTO or other folks who have been reading the articles and like, we need to do something about this. And then they'll find in the trenches, there's all these heroes that are already starting to do really cool things. And this stuff starts bubbling up and it's starting to break through silos. So I'm seeing that like 100 person, 500 person, 10,000 person companies where this is starting to break down data silos because this is starting to become something that the executives really care about. And now you're starting to see like people have actually been doing really cool things and it's making these people in the bowels kind of uh, heroes and the people that make things, uh, make data get shared more often amongst uh, various organizations, which is something that really needs to happen, especially in the wild, wild west that we're all living in, if you really want to get deeper insights. So like, oh, you'll find something cool over here. And they, they tried five or six different uh, open source. Yes, it's awesome, Miles, open source algorithms. And over here, they tried different ones and it's a different data set and they start talking. You've seen a lot of community building within big companies because of this. And it's great to be at the forefront of that. Okay, yeah, I would I would absolutely echo what Grant just said. I I think ML, um, you know, we went we just went through this whole movement of you know Docker and infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, and all of that came almost directly from developer right on up to the enterprise, and the enterprise wasn't really ready for it, or the top part of the enterprise wasn't really ready for it. I think ML comes in as it's it's a need. It's people get to the breaking point at trying to manipulate a large data set or a problem that they have. And it'll either come from the top end of the enterprise or it'll move down uh, to the developer. And it just kind of meets in the middle where the need is. And I, I find that that's where it's coming from. It's kind of this weird mishmash of people trying to figure it out and then looking in their tool bag. When they look in their tool bag, they don't, they don't have the right tool. And so they look out and they see all this great stuff that's been developed over the past three or four years with this promise of, hey, if you take a little bit of time, if you step back for a minute, take a deep breath and kind of learn machine learning, this is really going to open up your data and set you on a new path. And those are the teams that are adopting it right now. Um, I don't think anybody's just pulling in machine learning and like saying, we are going to do machine learning tomorrow. I think people really, they just have a true problem. And when they put their heads together, they go, we need to give this a shot. And fortunately, there's been a lot of people out there pushing this forward for the past four or five years where those two worlds are coming together and that's why it's taken off. Well, I mean, one of the biggest differences of this top down versus bottom up thing, I, you know, I was right there at the beginning of us selling cloud computing to the enterprise and we struggled to provide cogent, coherent, number driven examples of exactly what the ROI was when you shifted from building monoliths to building SaaS or building SOA or building whatever other archetype we decided was the right way to go this year. Uh, where exactly the opposite is the case with machine learning. It seems like every single example is, you know, take Google's our own power and cooling systems. We literally have some of the best engineers in the world trying to make more efficient our data centers. We turn all of that software off, hand it over to an ML model and it gets 40% more efficient on the first try, which is like a nine figure dollar savings per quarter. So there isn't an IT guy in the world that isn't going, oh, blah, blah, blah. I have air conditioners. I want to turn that thing on right now. I don't have to reteach anybody anything. I just want to make it so I spend less money on the AC. Like the, the proof comes right at the beginning of these case studies instead of eventually maybe you will possibly get some efficiency and productivity and security benefits. We think kind of, and we don't have any numbers for that. Good luck. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's why my number one advice for folks that are trying to figure out what to do is to do something. And it's to miles kind of running in a circle example, like, you know, with, with, you know, the amount of low hanging fruit and the gains that are 
uh, possible. Um, you know, just kind of sitting and waiting for it to all happen for you or to get all sorted out. Like it just, it doesn't make sense. Right. It's like, um, I said this earlier today. I don't know if I said it on the call on this call, but like, do you want to be the Netflix or the blockbuster of the cloud transition? Right. I think you want to be the Netflix, right? Cause the blockbuster is not around anymore. And you know, AI is an enabler of the proportions, you know, actually I think, you know, way beyond uh, what cloud did. Um, and so it's, I think it's, um, you know, if you're in a position to influence whether an, an organization starts to look at this technology, I think it's irresponsible not to be doing something. Um, so, yeah, just do it. Yeah, I think I agree with that. In fact, uh, I wanted to discuss about some of the technical issues related to AI adoption, but I think uh, we will keep it for another uh, panel in the future because we are running out of time. So I'm just changing the direction of the panel and uh, still sticking to the adoption issues. So, uh, one of the uh, complaints I get when I talk to people about uh, the, the doing AI in their organization is getting the uh, kind of uh, talent it takes for them to get started. Yeah, every, uh, if I talk to 10 CIOs, at least seven of them quote, talent issue as a big problem for them. So do you see that if, if that is the case, how it is going to impact the adoption? So uh, our, our most recent research study, this is the first year that talent gap has beaten security woes or terror as the number one blocker for adoption for any of these technologies. And, uh, and what I will tell you is compared to even two years ago, the technical sophistication required to apply machine learning to problems has gone to basically be able to do web development, right? These are there are now seven production machine learning models that are accessible just from Google Cloud. There are dozens more from dozens of other companies. To incorporate the magic of machine learning inside of products is about as hard as like making a web request to go pull an ad or something. It's as trivial as it can get. To build your own custom models to train against your own data for your own portions of problems is not always required to be able to get at some of this high performance behavior. But even in those situations, if you look at how straightforward the manuals, like it, it's a day long training course that we run for intro to TensorFlow, not a semester at school, it's a day. And there's free ones on Coursera. You, we hire kids to do this stuff. It is just not as hard as being a credentialed, multi-year certified IT professional to try and move around core infrastructure components. Frankly, that stuff is more complicated. So I, I don't think, I think the talent gap is perceived and is based on just slightly out of date information that three years ago, four years ago, Googlers wouldn't touch doing this software development work. It's really only in 2012 when we got started with it because it was super complicated back then. You needed really heavy mathematics experience to be able to apply yourselves to these problems where now yeah, you just run it against all the models we have available and see which one sticks. Yeah, I, I hear where you're coming from. Okay, and yeah, go ahead. I, I, you know, I think in, in st there are situations where that is to some degree true, but I think it's also trivializing the, um, you know, there's a lot of context that is required to, you know, deploy even someone else's model and make sure that the shit that it's telling you makes sense for your business. And it can be pretty dangerous to just go pull, pull some API off the shelf and throw out some data and build it into your app. Like, you know, what about the, if you don't really understand what it's doing, what about the corporate reputational risk that's at play, you know, to just surface some, you know, prediction that's based on, you know, biased data, for example, you know, that you didn't really have the, context to think about like there's I think that <clears throat> where I think you are absolutely right is that the barriers to entry are you know it's the threshold at the door like it is so low to get started and to start learning um, but I think uh, you know I think saying you know there's a difference between getting started and getting something into production and yeah there are some toy examples where you can pull an api and not even toy examples right there are some examples where you can pull an api off the shelf you know the api just happens to be like fit for purpose for your application um and you can get going you know without knowing anything 
Um, but you're kind of, you're placing a bet that on that. On I mean, that, we put, a, we put a, bl a blog post yesterday. An intern gets started at Giphy. They make the graphic stuff. She gets pissed that when she does searches for the plain text that's in movie quotes, she doesn't find the GIF that came from that movie sequence. So she takes all of the text out of all the images using the Vision API, uses the NLP API to put that into a list, actually uses one of our competitors' queuing systems, SQS, to run the data through, and now all Giphy searches are 31% more accurate to the request from their customers. She's an intern. She did it for fun. No, I fully agree with you on, uh, on uh, those low-hanging use cases. It definitely works. Uh, Grant, you have been running a company based entirely on AI. Do you think uh, uh, you're tapping into some APIs will help your engineers get going, or do you see that the real talent problem? Yeah, so we um, we're in a totally different side of things, and uh, the talent gap is is totally real in the world that we live in. Um, I think in the in the world around data science and younger engineers being able to do things, um, there's definitely, as Miles saying, it's it's easier. Um, garbage in, garbage out, though. If people don't know what data they're working on, that happens way way more often. There's so many great algorithms, but most people don't understand the data they're working with to begin with. Um, the products that we build, people understand the space that they're trying to get answers for. They can ask questions uh, around uh, around security, for instance. And these people are oftentimes English majors, um, and they're security experts. And the products that we build are all about helping it so that you actually don't have to be technical, but you can ask these questions because you have domain expertise. And so back to what Sam was saying, you need to have the domain expertise to actually be able to be part of this. And so, yeah, it is becoming easier, but the domain expertise really matters. So with your example, the intern, she just just the way you talked about it. She had domain expertise. She totally got it. She's probably she's actually probably very bright, and she probably is. Uh, she probably has a lot of good ideas. So it really comes back to, to the domain expertise and us creating tools. All of us, it's our job to to create tools that make it easier for those with the domain expertise to to be able to get their jobs done even more efficiently. Yeah. The other thing that that I'm yeah. seeing around this talent uh, question is, you know, there was a point in time like four or five years ago when we would talk about this data scientist as like a unicorn that encompassed like a whole bunch of skills. Like it was like the full stack data person. They had to be the domain expert. They had to be the statistician. They had to be the person that understood the data pipelines and how the data gets moved around. And I think uh, more recently, like the past year and change, there's been uh, maybe two, uh, a, a lot of maturity around our thinking there. And there's uh, more often I'm seeing teaming models where you know those three are separate people, right? So the data scientist is a person that has that statistical background and knows what the patterns in the data mean and what the predictions mean and how they can be used. There's the domain expert uh, that they partner with, and they're also partnering increasingly with a, a machine learning ex engineer. And this is the person that, like, you know, can look at the API <clears throat> um, signature and figure out how to get the data in, get the data out, and produce the results quickly. And, you know, with these, with all of these roles in place, you know, enterprises can really accelerate uh, delivering solutions that can go into production. Um, <clears throat> but they don't have to find the one person that, you know, knows all those things anymore. Here's okay. one of the big yeah. problems is that you need to, you, you still need a teacher. You, you need someone who can make the system learn. And if you're working with images and you're working with speech, we have been tackling those problems for more than a decade. So if you need image processing, if you need speech recognition, if you need text recognition, those are things we've been working on for a very long time. We have been able to teach those algorithms. If I have a business problem, if I'm an enterprise and I have a business problem that doesn't fit images or maybe doesn't fit text or maybe it, my data works differently, I need someone who can teach my system how to run or it's like a lost child in the woods, right? There, it's, it's not going to get you where you want. You're never going to that. You're never going to regress to the bottom of the channel and figure out, you know, what my answer is. You're just gonna wander around forever. So depending on the enterprise, depending on what they're looking for, you do need someone who not only understands data, but understands how to teach the system. So those are the people that are very hard to get. And for enterprises that don't necessarily work in the public space, 
who need machine learning for internal use, they need a teacher. And those teachers are not easy to find. Yeah, thanks. I think we are running out of time. So, but uh, this is a discussion. I had uh, so many other questions which we couldn't even come to. So uh, we can probably have a follow up panel later. So uh, before we quit, like uh, one startup uh, you think has a pretty good future from what you see. And uh, as far as Grant is concerned, I know Insight, uh, Insight Engines has a great future, but I want another uh, name here. Yeah, go ahead. Who wants uh, to go first? I like, uh, I like Plenty. They're doing AI optimized uh, plant growing in local like containerized farms. It's, their iteration rate is stupefying. Yeah, so I've got, uh, there are tons of startups that I think are doing interesting things. Um, but one comes to mind just based on what Kevin just said. Uh, and now I'm kind of plugging a client of mine, but uh, this company Bonsai, a big part of what their uh, platform is trying to, uh, to do is enable machine teaching. Like this is a message that they incorporate at the highest level of uh, the way they talk about their product. And it's kind of interesting because it allows a, a developer slash analyst to incorporate higher level concepts uh, into models uh, in a pretty interesting way. And one company I'm seeing that um, is doing some interesting things in the security space, since that's where I live and breathe um, a lot of my life, is uh, Jask. Uh, Jask is, uh, is doing some really interesting things where they're kind of rethinking uh, what a sim should be like. And, uh, and they, they should be an interesting company to be looking at. Kevin? Oh, you're going to put me on the spot here. Um, I was trying to look up their name because it just left my left. I'm, I'm really interested in the security companies. And I'm sorry, the startup just left my name. But um, I'm really interested in app to app security and how machine learning can work with setting up um, algorithms. So applications can speak to each other securely using their own security algorithms. And there's a few I know uh, a lot of the research is coming out of Pittsburgh University. And I know there's a startup that just started around it. And I forgot their name, so I'll have to get back to you on the name of it. I apologize for that, but sure. that's a space that really interests me. That sounds an awful lot like we, one we just put in the investment in Bitium. Okay, awesome. Thanks, guys. It was a great discussion, and I think uh, there is a lot more to discuss in the future. This is a really great panel, and I enjoyed talking to all of you. And uh, thanks to the listeners. We will be putting this out in the Rishi Dot Research. Uh, YouTube page and uh, we will share it uh, share uh, when it is ready and uh, we will get back to another panel probably next month and uh, this discussion on AI in enterprise will continue because today's uh, the panel is an unfinished panel so thank you thanks very much and I want to leave with one point as Sam said do something don't be the blockbuster of artificial intelligence thank you all right bye thanks Chris all right, everyone thank you thanks guys Thanks a lot, everybody.